This is Focus on Your Health. It's brought to you by Kingman Regional Medical Center in historic Kingman, Arizona. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week my guest is Dr. Edgardo Rivera. He's the Director of Oncology Services at KRMC. Dr. Edgardo Rivera, welcome. Thank you. Welcome back. We talked, uh, <laughs> let's see, it was um, about a year and three months ago, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. You were new here at that time. And I, I think it was like your first day, I stuck microphones in front of you and said, <laughs> say something interesting. Oh my God, it's been, yeah, actually, like you said, it's been a year and, actually a year and about five months now yeah, yeah. since I first arrived. So how's it it's been? a lot of changes. Yeah, well, I want to talk about that. How's the first year and five months been for you? Good, good. Yeah. Uh, part of it has been getting to know the community, mm-hmm. uh, getting to know how the hospital works. Yeah. Um, looking at what are changes that we needed to make right. and changes that we want to eventually uh, make in the near future and, uh, and working with the community and different organizations. So right. try to uh, continue help grow the cancer center. Yeah, and that first day I was here, uh, you had one of, the, one of the employees here over your shoulder and you're like, you're looking at some kind of medical form online, and you're like, "All right, how do you guys do this? What is what is this thing?" Right? I don't know if you recall, but it was like, you know, you're bringing 25 years or so of expertise and trying to uh, implement a new system here, and you know, that's why they called you. You have a background in in research, in education, um, in pharmaceutical field, right? I'm sure what the right, right way to say that is. That's correct. And you know, you remember very well. I'm so I've done research know. in the past. I've done patient care. Yeah. Uh, I've worked in uh, pharmaceutical industry. Actually, part of my job in the past was to help develop drugs for right. cancer. Um, um, like I said, I've done quite a lot of research also. I've done a lot of administrative work as well. Right. And uh, so I just combine all that right. to try to, to look in terms of the things that we need here to improve the cancer care, not only not only for Kimam, but for the entire Mojave County. Right. You say I remember, and I do, but for you, it was a half-hour conversation. I listen to the shows again and again while I'm preparing them, so it's, it's like we're old pals for me. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that time we talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> so as you've been implementing, you came in here with a certain vision to kind of help shape the way the, the oncology program runs. Correct. So, you know, part of the first thing that I wanted to do here was to make sure that patients understood that they were coming um, to a very stable environment. There have been quite a lot of changes in the cancer center uh, in in the past. Um, So we were wanting to make sure that they understood that, you know, we have a level of stability now. There's a new, new physician. So, and we also wanted to you know, spread the word in terms of what other services that we were providing. So also one of my goals was also to start bringing here some of the newer treatments. So, you know, since last year, almost every month we're getting somewhere from two, three, even four uh, new oncology drugs being approved by the FDA. Wow. So, and in the past, unfortunately, we had not uh, use or even though those drugs were available, they had not been used here, uh, not only here in KMC, but in most of Mojave County. So now we do. Uh, we were uh, probably the first cancer center in Mojave County to actually treat a patient with immunotherapy. You know, as soon as it came out, the first immunotherapy became available, we actually um, started treating patients. And you know, our intention is really to, every time we get something approved by the FDA, that we're able to provide that to the patient. So so we've been able to do that. Um, we have been able to expand the group of uh, oncology nurses that we have. Um, we continue to work in a relationship with Mayo Clinic, uh, exchanging information, exchanging knowledge, being able to refer the patients, you know, back and forth from uh, Mayo if they need something that perhaps we don't have here. So that has been great. Uh, we'll continue to work with Mayo Clinic as well. Um, also, one of the things that I'm hoping to be able to bring uh, sometime in 2016 is to start uh, opening clinical trials here, research trials here at KMC. Um, we have a position that hopefully will be open soon. 
uh, where we can bring a clinical trials uh, manager and we can start opening uh, clinical research uh, trials uh, so the patients don't have to go all the way to Phoenix, they don't have to go to Las Vegas. So we brought new staff. Uh, we hired a nurse practitioner who's helping us with the volume of patients, especially those patients who have already completed treatment uh, that now have become survivors. And, you know, after five years, obviously, we still continue to see those patients, even if we see them just once a year. So to help us with those patients, be able to look into some of the needs and some of the things that we can offer uh, cancer survivors. So, so it's a lot of things going on. It is a lot. Um, yeah. A lot of things that we've been doing. Um, we um, sort of reorganized the structure of the, uh, of the cancer center, looking at the possibility of also of a physical uh, expansion for the mm-hmm. cancer center as well, yeah. and, uh, and working with other outside organizations. So. A, a few things stand out to me in that list of all the of the upgrades that you've been yeah. doing. You know, and one is that you said uh, three to four new drugs have been approved each month. Like, okay, mm-hmm. so the last time we talked, we got into a bit. You were saying how difficult it is for new cancer drugs, or maybe new drugs at all, but particularly new cancer drugs to to meet approval. Right? There are all this. There's all this research and all this money that goes into it, and you can get very close, and then it won't. Get approved. Does that sound right? That's correct. So a lot of time, you know, it requires a lot of time, a lot of money, right. uh, a lot of research before we can get a drug approved, right? And there's a lot of complaints in the past about the FDA perhaps not moving fast enough. Yeah. But to tell you the truth, they've been doing a very good job about getting drugs through and approved uh, and make them make those making those drugs available to the public. So, um, so f- perfect example, you know. Uh, last week, we had a drug that was approved for renal cell. We had uh, another one that uh, was approved for bladder cancer uh, that is completely new, new immunotherapy. Uh, we've had um, tons of drugs recently approved for melanoma. Uh, we had um, uh, uh, immunotherapy approved not only now for lung cancer, but also kidney cancer, melanoma, uh, bladder cancer. Um, and they're looking at even approving some other diseases. So they've been moving pretty fast. So, so uh, does this suggest, I mean, is that more drugs approved lately than usual? This has been between last year and so far what we've seen in 2016. Right. We've seen more drugs approved than probably in all the years that I've wow. practiced oncology. That's crazy. Um, you know, so it's quite a lot of uh of new information, new that we have to learn also. Right. Because with new drugs, we obviously we have to learn how to manage those drugs and how to deal with the side effects that sometimes can come with those new drugs. Right. But it's been exciting because it's actually good for the oncology patients. Right. It's great for the cancer patient. And because what it means is that now they have more options available. So, You know, as a somewhat of an outsider, when you talk about all these new drugs coming, it suggests to me that there have been some real breakthroughs. Is that safe to say? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's some even new classes of drugs that, uh, so we're not talking just about new drugs, but actually drugs that work in a way, you know, they have a mechanism of action that is completely different than what we've used in the past. Yeah. Um, and what we're seeing now is that now the, the cancer patients can live a lot longer. Wow. So, yeah. And how do you keep up with all of that? I mean, you know, it's it's not easy. Right. Um, you know, I, I get connected. Um, you know, we uh, as oncologists, as practicing oncologists, we we do get informed uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Right. What's going on? What's out there? What's what's being studied? What uh, any preliminary results of any study? Uh, we get notified of that, and as soon as the FDA. Uh, uh, you know, gets a drug through the whole process of approval. We also get notified. And then the first thing I do is, you know, can we then bring the drug here okay. to Keeman? Right. Can the hospital uh, be able to provide that drug or not? Good thing is that uh, some of, a, lot of, uh, a lot of those new drugs that are being approved, some of them are actual oral medications. They're by mouth. Um, so then we work with specialty pharmacy. We work with the patient's uh, insurance, uh, you know, to hopefully be able to provide that uh, type of therapy so i know that you know we've talked about research is a big part of your your life and your professional career and you mentioned that you want to start bringing that into your work here 
at, at KRMC. Absolutely, because KRMC has never had oncology research that before. That was my first question. <laughs> you know, so they never had that here. Yeah. And I think that nowadays, you know, most nowadays oncology patients want to be able to uh, be able to have all the services that they could normally or normally would have to go to a big cancer center to be able to receive those services. Patients nowadays, they want to stay closer to home. Right. They don't want to have to travel. And even if it's an hour, um, they don't want to have to travel. They want to stay closer to home. That makes sense. And one of the things that sometimes we do offer the patients is the possibility of being able to participate in a clinical trial. Um, and that will hopefully bring also additional options to the patient. And what I want to be able to do is be able to have that here. So the patient doesn't have to necessarily go to Las Vegas or Phoenix to look for the possibility of participating on a research study. So that's significant for the patient, of course. I mean, I imagine if you're, if you're sick and you know, you've been diagnosed with cancer, you don't want to hit the road. You don't want to, I mean, you want to be home, right? Exactly. You want to be resting. Um, but also, what is the significance for this institution to be able to do research? You know, just to be part of perhaps uh, be able to provide something that can help us in the actual fight against cancer, right. that to me is significant. Uh, not only for us as physicians, but also for the hospital to be able to say that, you know, hey, we were able to participate on the clinical trial that uh, drug X or drug Y uh, eventually led to the approval of that specific drug. So, right. um, so to me, that's significant. And to be able to provide that uh, uh, to the patient the, the opportunity to be able to try a drug that otherwise would not be commercially available right. to me that's significant so yeah you know and it, and it really raises the level of expertise yeah. uh, uh, of the hospital to a different really to a different level so yeah and i'm kind of i'm seeing that subtext form in in everything that you're covering which is um we are kind of an outpost right we're a long way from bigger cities and yet we have this connection with the mayo clinic um, you have brought in a lot of good people. Um, we have a lot of great technology for a small place. We have a lot of yeah. amazing technology, right? Talking about research and implementing that those measures. And I think maybe, you know, the internet is a part of this where we're not so much of an outpost anymore. We're, we're connected and so much closer to the cutting edge. Exactly. So, you know, that this it is really in order for a cancer center to to work, to be able to provide what the patient needs, we need to be interacting with others. We mm -hmm. need to look at what what is it that the NCI is offering? What is it that pharmaceutical companies are, can offer that we don't have? What is it? What are the different specialties that we currently don't have that we need to eventually bring here? Uh, what are the needs of the patient? You know, uh, you know, cancer has become a chronic disease. So it's, new, it, it's not what it used to be before, that it used to be a death sentence. Um, it's become a chronic disease. People can live with cancer for a long, long time. So, and many, you know, we're one of the few specialties where we can still say that we can still cure some of the patients, right? Um, so because of that um, and because of all the advances that have happened and because we've learned so much about cancer, uh, we know how to better, better manage, how to better treat it. Uh, so then we deal with patients who really keep coming here for years and years, and they're still alive and doing well. It's time for a quick break on Focus on Your Health. We'll be back for more with Dr. Edgardo Rivera in just a moment. Stick around. Welcome back to Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo, and this week my guest is Dr. Edgardo Rivera. 
He's the Director of Oncology Services at KRMC. When you think of, and you're starting to touch on this, but when you think of your 25 years in oncology, um, tell me a little bit about how cancer has changed, cancer treatment and what that means to have that diagnosis. You know, it's very, um, you know, it's, it's not a death sentence like it used to be. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more hope. There's a lot more uh, treatments available than it was when it first started. A um, lot more different options. We've, I think the more important uh, step that we've made in oncology is that we now recognize that there's the genetic differences in all cancers, that not all breast cancers are the same, that not all lung cancers are the same. You know, we've now learned to look at uh, a more intricate uh, detail um, in terms of how that disease behave, you know, looking at molecular testing and genetic uh, biological markers and how we can actually treat better and be more specific and be able to provide a more individualized treatment for the patient where that patient will have the better chances of surviving the disease. So I think that's where oncology has changed. It continues to be a very integrated, multidisciplinary specialty, uh, oncology is, where you will need the input of the surgeons, will need the input from the radiation oncologists and obviously from the medical oncologists. But it has also become a disease and a specialty where we've learned actually how uh, to manage the patient in a more intricate and detailed uh, fashion. So, and, and how does that influence where? Because we, we talked about where it's coming from. How does that influence where it's headed? I, I think that at one point uh, what I th- think is going to happen is that uh, most of the decisions in oncology will be made based on really the molecular makeup or the genetic makeup of the cancer. And that uh, we're going to be moving away from doing uh, so many invasive procedures. We're probably going to see less and less surgery being done, uh, probably even be, uh, even perhaps not to even uh, provide uh, or have to give chemo to all patients, you know. Right. So we're going to see something even more detailed and more individualized for each patient and relying more and more on the actual biological and genetic makeup of the cancer. So. Um, are you talking about how there are a lot of different experts on this on the team, right? And I know right now we're watching the clock because you have tumor board you have to yeah. get to. And that's something that probably people don't know about, right? They probably think, here's the doctor, he does this, and then, well, if I have to go for radiation. I, but can you talk a little bit about tumor board? Yeah, tumor board, is? you know, most, most organizations will have a tumor board because oncology is so multidisciplinary, mm-hmm. we do need to get the f- feedback and the input from all the specialties. It's the, the, really the forum where we discuss not only the diagnosis of the patient, is this the right diagnosis? Um, we discuss, we look at the Im- Im- imaging of the patient, you know, we look at their, whether the patient had a, a CT scan or had a PET CT, um, but most importantly, then we discuss the management of that patient. What is it that is going to be giving the patient the best chances of survival? How is this patient should be managed? So most people think that, you know, the patient come in and they'll see a medical oncologist and uh, we make our decision ourselves. The reality is that we also get all the people involved. Um, there are certain cancers in which the approach, the multidisciplinary approach is more commonly used than others. For example, breast cancer, lung cancer, those are... Uh, type of diseases that you do need a very integrated and multidisciplinary approach. You need the feedback from the surgeon and the radiation oncologist and the medical oncologist. Um, but as a general rule, that's sort of a practice. So we do uh, we do a tumor board every week um, uh, on a Tuesday, uh, where we actually go through some of our patients that we see newer patients or patients that are a little more complex, and then we decide as a group what will be the best treatment choice for the patient. It sounds like you really see the advantage of having multiple perspectives yes. to look at each case. And we case. have our pathologists there, we have our radiologists there, right. we have our surgeons. So, Right. I recently got a note that said you were appointed to the board of directors for Susan G. Komen, Arizona. That's correct. That's cool. So That is very cool. Congratulations, and tell me what that means. So, you know, most people are familiar with 
uh, Komen or Susan G. Komen sure. is a national organization. Uh, is really dedicated to uh, the mission of eventually being able, not only to be able to educate but also prevent and hopefully one of these days be able to find the cure of breast cancer. Mm-hmm. So now we used to have Komen uh, Northern and Central Arizona and Komen Southern Arizona. Now they're all merged into just Komen Arizona. Okay. Um, there's a state board. I'll be representing uh, Northern Arizona, not just Keeman. Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I think I'm the only board member representing Northern Arizona, which is great. And part of it is simply because, unfortunately, Mojave County, uh, over one third of all our breast cancer patients present with very advanced disease. Uh. Uh, we're actually second in the whole state. Um, so, that is that's alarming. Meaning, you know? there's a significant portion of the population not getting their annual checks. Yeah, or they're not. They're just simply not. They're when they present, they present with very advanced diseases. Right. These are not patients who are presenting with a stage one or stage two cancer. They're presenting with stage four. Right. So, so very advanced, um, and you know, it's alarming to say, but we're number two in the whole state. Yeah. And so because of that. We're going to be working closely with Komen, Arizona. By me being on that board, it's going to help really strengthen the relationship between KMC um, and uh, Komen, and hopefully work in different projects. Right now, we receive uh, grants from Komen looking at uh, screening and be able to provide uh, access to mammography. But I think that eventually what we want to do is look at the possibility of obtaining funding where we see the patient from the beginning, they go through a mammogram, uh, if they get diagnosed, then that we can help them through all the different steps, including treatment. Right. I have one more question for you before I let you run, and that is, um, can we talk a little bit about the continuum of care? So let's just say, this is day one, you've gotten awful news that you have a diagnosis of cancer. What happens then? You know, it's, I think the important thing here to, to realize is not just, you know, having cancer, having been diagnosed with cancer, it's not just, you know, okay, you get you get diagnosed and then you go through treatment mm-hmm. and that's it. Um, we've uh, put in more emphasis in terms of looking at survivorship, mm-hmm. you know, from the day the patient gets diagnosed. As a matter of fact, even before, you know, going through screening, right? Um, so the patient gets diagnosed, they go through the treatment, but there's a continuity. You know, we continue to follow those patients even after five years, you know, even if they don't come here that often, simply because there are issues that uh, uh, survivor, you know, cancer survivors can go through, whether it's uh, issues with their sexuality or issues with, uh, you know, reproductive issues or, um, you know, issues related to their physical well-being so um, that is why the NCI and most organizations have been focusing not only on the actual diagnosis and treatment but also on survivorship meaning the continuum after treatment has been completed what will be the next step what are the things that we need to look for what are the things that we can offer for the patients once they completed the treatment so that's something that we're going to uh, be doing here. Um, that's one of my goals too, and be able to eventually have a sort of full fledged survivorship program. That's Dr. Edgardo Rivera. He's the Director of Oncology Services at KRMC. Dr. Rivera, Como siempre, ha sido un placer. <laughs> Igualmente. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. And that's the show that is Focus on Your Health. I'm T.G. Lafredo. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to write to me, you can send me an email at foyhradio at gmail.com. That's Focus on Your Health, F-O-Y-H, radio, at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next week. Yeah, disproportionate numbers, right? Yeah, that's what I keep hearing. They're calling you?